Good day everyone. Today we're going to have a look at turbochargers. We'll start at the bare basics of what they are and what they do. We'll have a look at after coolers and intercoolers as well. And we'll pull this monster apart and just have a look at how everything works inside and what we can do to rebuild it. So let's get started. Now, of course, I'm sure all of you know what a turbocharger is, but I do have one here as an example. Now, these things have been around for decades, but they didn't really become popular, at least in passenger cars, until the 1970s and 1980s. And of course, we have the sports car era of the 1990s in Japan, where these things are used on pretty much every engine to create more power out of a smaller engine. So let's have a look at just how it works. Okay, well, how does the turbocharger work? Well, we have an exhaust manifold here where all the exhaust gases collect at this flange and they travel around this turbine or exhaust housing. Now, the turbine at the end here, or the exhaust wheel, is turned by these exhaust gases and is connected by a shaft to the impeller here, or compressor wheel. And as you can see here, if I blow air through the turbine housing, it turns a compressor wheel and we can see air is coming out of the compressor housing, ready to go into the intake. Now, of course, the traveling of exhaust gases isn't enough. It's also the heat we have coming out of the exhaust gases. As we put more fuel in and we accelerate, we create a lot more heat traveling through this part of the turbocharger. As it travels through here, the heat is expanding the gases, creating more and more pressure inside this housing, turning the turbine faster and faster. As the turbine turns faster, the impeller is going to suck more air and compress it into the intake tract of the engine. In this case, this turbocharger can create up to 30 PSI of boost pressure at full load. So the more and more heat we have in here, the better. Heat gives us expansion, which gives us more and more boost. Of course, as we create heat and boost, this shaft is turning on a bearing journal in the center here. So the center part, or the cartridge, has oil pressure traveling through it and draining back into the sump, not only to lubricate the bearing, whether it be journal or roller bearing, but it also cools the turbocharger as the oil travels through it back to the sump. This particular turbocharger also has lines in it for coolant. So we can have coolant travel through the cartridge as well to help keep them temperatures of the cartridge and the engine oil down just a little bit. So with all this boost going on, just how do we control how much boost the turbocharger makes? Well, this particular one has a wastegate on it. And the wastegate's job is to allow exhaust gas to bypass the turbine wheel when we reach maximum boost. There is a spring and a diaphragm in here. When we have 30 PSI in this line coming from the compressor housing, this will open the flap and allow the exhaust gas to bypass the turbine wheel, therefore slowing it down. Now there's a few ways we can modify this. We can add a heavier spring so it opens later. We can adjust this push rod here so it doesn't open as much. Or we can add a boost T to this line here. If we add a boost T, we can leak off some of that boost and trick the wastegate into thinking we have less boost than we have. If we have 30 PSI in the line and we leak off 5 PSI, the actuator will actually only read 25 PSI, and therefore opening the wastegate later. We can also add an electronic boost controller to these lines where we can control the boost and control just how much we want to leak off on the fly if we really want to. But that's the most controlled way in which we can modify just how much boost these turbochargers make. Of course, factory settings are always gonna be the best for the turbocharger and the engine, but we can make more boost if we want to. So when it comes to the pros and cons of turbocharging, obviously a big pro is that we're gonna make more power. We're also gonna make more power when we need it. If you bolt one of these to a small engine, we can idle around all day very efficiently, not making any boost, but when we need the power, we can put our foot down, this livens up, we create boost, and we make much more power. We don't need the displacement to make the power, and then when we don't need it, we can be very efficient. On the con side of things, you are adding complexity to an engine. You're adding a turbocharger, of course, and you're adding a lubrication system, and we're also adding quite a bit of weight. This particular turbocharger is very, very heavy. Not all of this big or this heavy, of course, but we are adding complexity and weight to an engine design, which also adds cost. Also on the con side of things, we are adding a lot of heat to the intake system. And that's when we need a charge air cooler. And we'll talk about that next. So as I mentioned earlier, heat is a big con of the turbocharger. As we bring air in here and we compress it, it heats up. We can see temperatures upwards of 200 degrees Celsius coming out of this side of the turbocharger. We need to take the heat out of the air because hot air is less dense and we can't add as much fuel to it as we could if the air was cooler. So usually we'll see a charge air cooler 
after the turbocharger to bring the heat down before it enters the combustion chamber of the engine. Whether we call it an aftercooler or an intercooler, it doesn't really matter. Basically, it's a cooler that comes after the turbocharger in order to cool down that charge air so it is more dense and we can add more fuel to it to make more power. Now we do have a few different types of cooler when it comes to cooling down the charge air of a turbocharger. We have the air to air after cooler, we have the water to air after cooler, and in the marine applications we do see heat exchanges where the air will travel down a tube outside of the boat and allow seawater to take the heat out of the charge air before it goes into the engine. Most we see on four-wheel drives and cars are air to air after coolers, mainly because they're simplistic and they're easy to make. Basically we have a radiator effectively where we have air traveling through it and air traveling over it and the air traveling over it as we drive along takes the heat out of the charge air before it enters the engine. If we have a water to air after cooler we either have engine jacket water cooling down the air traveling into the engine or we have a separate cooling system where we have cold air traveling through a core and we have the charge air traveling over it to take the heat out of that charged air. Now just quickly, when it comes to terminology between after coolers, heat exchangers, charge air coolers and intercoolers, there really is no difference. Basically, in the industry that this comes from, we would usually say after cooler because the cooler is located after the turbocharger and before the intake of the engine. The reason we'd have the word intercooler is because we have a cooler occasionally between another turbocharger and this one, which is an intermediately cooler between the turbocharger before it goes into the secondary turbocharger and then the after cooler and then the engine. We also have a lot of two-stroke diesels kicking around where we'll have a blower to bring air in because a two-stroke won't scavenge and we'll have an intermediately cooler between the blower and the turbocharger before it goes to the after cooler and into the engine. So in our industry we call it an intercooler because it's in between two chargers and we call it an after cooler because it's after the last charger. It doesn't really matter if you have an intercooler on a car and the car companies call it an intercooler. It's basically a cooler between the turbocharger and the engine. Okay, with that all said, let's pull these two housings off here and let's have a look inside the turbocharger. Okay, this particular turbocharger is held together with two V-bands. We can see them here. The advantage of having the V-bands is we can rotate the two housings to suit all types of different intakes. So this turbo might fit many different engines with intake that travels down, up, we can turn it wherever we need to. So I'll undo these two and we can remove the two housings and have a look inside. Okay, I've just taken the exhaust housing off this particular turbocharger and just before I strip it, we'll look at the most important thing we can do to check the health of the turbocharger. We can do this when it's still fitted to the vehicle, in fact. We wanna put a dial indicator and mag base onto the housing of the turbocharger and we want to check the end float of the shaft. The end float is very important because if it gets excessive, these wheels can start to contact the housings in which they're in. If they start to move laterally, they will start to mill into the housing. So we want to make sure that the thrust washers are in good enough condition that the turbocharger is serviceable. The end float test is the first test we do before we even strip the turbocharger. So let's have a look. So our dial indicator mag base is all set up and we're just going to check the end float of the turbocharger. Now we're sitting on about 0.05 of a mil, which is very, very good. We, we are actually happy with that on a turbocharger of this size, and of course it's gonna vary depending on your turbocharger manufacturer, but 0.05 millimeter of end float is just fine. Okay, so we've just pulled the turbocharger apart. We've got the turbine housing here, which was held on with this V-band. Compressor housing, much the same with another V-band here. I've just undone the compressor wheel itself. So the shaft is two pieces and the compressor wheel is threaded on. This is a left-hand thread, so we've had to tighten it effectively for it to come out. Now, the rest of the shaft is still sitting in the cartridge here. And if we just give this a little bit of a tap, it's gonna come out. So let's just have a go at that. We'll grab a hammer and we'll just tap the rest of the shaft out of the cartridge so we can have a look at all the pieces. There it goes. Probably want to be a bit more careful if you are going to reuse your turbocharger. But there is the rest of the shaft there. This one has a spacer here. Not all turbochargers will have the spacer, but this one does. We have our journal bearing here, which is actually in very good condition. And we have a pair of seals on this side here as well, just to stop the oil bypassing into the exhaust side of the turbocharger. The things we're looking for here, we're looking for any, any damage to the uh, turbine wheel and the compressor wheel. Make sure there's no uh, corrosion or cavitation or any bent fins or physical damage. These things are highly balanced. So anything, any bent fin, we'll put them out of balance and we will get a failed bearing and probably a lot of noise from the turbocharger. 
We'll check out the cartridge and make sure that the uh, thrust washers are still in good condition there. We've got two thrust washers that stop these thrusting backwards and forwards too much like we checked earlier. And just check the housings for corrosion or anything else that's gonna cause leaks, air leaks, oil leaks, whatever kind of leaks we want. We can also check the balance and the straightness of the shaft if you have the technology to do so. I don't have that here, so I'm just gonna visually inspect, clean everything up and put it all back together. So that's pretty much everything about this particular type of turbocharger. Of course, there are out there now variable vane, variable geometry or variable nozzle turbos where we can vary the size of the intake housing to match boost over a much more broader rev range as we vary the size of the intake of the turbo. But that's a subject for another video. Thank you very much for watching and I'm gonna put this all back together.